even if he gets out of prison, there should still be repercussions. There's not much else you can do. They can do whatever they want when they get that PIN number. They say the best things in life are free But you can give them to the birds and bees I need money That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want Hi there, I'm Tom Natchew. Welcome to another edition of Fraud Squad TV. Now, if you've been watching our show, you'll see that criminals who focus all of their efforts on fraudulently taking your money are beginning to reinvent schemes on old themes. The Nigerian 419 scam, for instance, has become a letter informing you of a death in the family. Maybe that's overseas and somebody's left you a fortune. Doesn't sound believable at all, does it? So why do people continuously believe these scams? Well, many of us are vulnerable by way of desperation. There may be a need for instant cash, and we talk ourselves into believing that maybe just this once, it's true. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. Home is where most of us feel our safest. After we lock our doors and turn on our security systems, we rarely feel nervous about criminals coming into our homes to invade us or victimize us. But as we'll see in this story, bad guys who engage in home improvement fraud make a point of hitting you where you live, quite literally. Minneapolis, Minnesota, a quaint Nordic city whose people enjoy the simple pleasures life has to offer. One of the biggest statues in the downtown core is not of a president nor a war hero, but of Mary Tyler Moore, whose fictional TV character, Mary Richards, claimed Minneapolis as her home. There's an innocence about this city and its people. They trust you almost instantly, and the fraudster in this story used that to his full advantage. A home improvement con man took advantage of that trust in the worst way possible. This case jumped out as a criminal case where you had a contractor who took $800,000 from an elderly couple to remodel a 600 square foot home. How the crooked contractor padded the numbers is indeed as bad as you can get for an elderly couple living in a small home in Minneapolis. Here's their close friend and neighbor, William Lurkey, to tell us their story. Well, the, the siding was wooden, gutters were falling off and the eaves were hanging down. It was getting to look bad. Clearly the home of William's close friend, Jerry, was in a state of disrepair and it needed some serious attention. But Jerry was a retired TV repairman and his wife just didn't work, so being able to afford the costly repairs seemed unlikely. But when the renovation started, William realized they'd come into some money. When she got it, she wanted to remodel the house, but it just didn't seem like that little house was worth putting that much money into. Rick Gerowitz and his company, Home Update, were marketers and he was a salesman. Primarily, they did aluminum siding. In some ways, he was not unlike the Tin Men, the aluminum siding salespeople. So he would go out, find business, and then he would subcontract out. The crew that was working there, they were fly by night. They did so many things the hard way, and they'd stand out on the sidewalk smoking cigarettes and looking at the house like they didn't know what to do next. She was a smart person, like I said, book smart. There was a couple of things that she had said earlier through the year that made me realize she's starting to get old. Then ever so often this nice car would come up, this guy was in it. He'd talk to her for a while, and it was like that's when he was hitting her up. They had to have more money to do something. When we went through the records, there was work that was done, but that work amounted to seventy-five dollars to $150,000 worth of work. The house is in more shambles today than it was when it started. He talked the talk like he had done it all his life and knew what he was doing, but when you looked inside afterwards, why? couldn't understand how they could even live in there. With Jerry suffering from Alzheimer's and his cancer-stricken wife trying her best to take care of him, well, William believed that his friends were being scammed. It was time to step in. So he sent his daughter over to check on Jerry's failing health. We 
asked our daughter about it. She said to go check it out, give him the benefit of the doubt, but he wasn't in no mood to talk about it. So that's when my daughter called the cops. Once the police learned how much was paid for the job, they immediately arrested the contractor. We examined the bank accounts of Home Update Company. There was a river cruise in, in Europe. There are payments for Mr. Gurowitz's condo. There were payments for cars. It was a personal checkbook. At the trial, he was given twice the usual sentence. This is by far the worst contractor swindle that I've ever seen. He should suffer for a long time. Even if he gets out of prison, there should still be repercussions hanging on him all his life. The judge sentenced Mr. Gurowitz to 114 months in prison, and then after that to a term of 20 years probation consecutive to the prison term. I'm sure there's a lot of contractors that are going to pad the numbers a little bit for their own benefit, but I mean, he just outright swindled them. The homeowner had Alzheimer's disease. His wife had cancer. The experience put him in an institution and his wife passed away shortly after paying the bill. In a case like this where there's been such devastation to, to victims like the Caverleys, it, it really hits you. It does. One more time with Craig Hannaford here talking about this kind of fraud. Now this one really gets under my skin. I imagine it gets under a law enforcement officer's skin. What kind of a scumbag would do this to such an elderly couple? Well, obviously it's uh, somebody who has absolutely no conscience. All they want is your money and they will lie and cheat to get it. Well, that's the lowest form of life. Now, is there any recourse that this couple or their family might have? Well, the problem with these home improvement frauds is the money usually goes out the door first, and it's very hard to recoup it. So it's important to do your research, do your due diligence before you hire a contractor. You don't want to get scammed like this, this one. That's a good point. Now listen up, Craig's got some more tips so that you can prevent this from happening to you. Here's a few tips to find out if a building contractor is legitimate or not. Check to see how long the contractor has been in business. Check with the local licensing authority to make sure that the contractor is properly licensed. Always ask for references from previous customers and call and visit the references homes to inspect the work done and see if it was done in a, in a good manner. Determine if the contractor does the work himself or if they subcontract the work out to others. For many people, their debit card is considered a much safer way to access money than to carry around a lot of cash. But there's been a growing trend happening where people accessing an ATM with their debit card are discovering that their accounts have been robbed. Now, how is this possible? It's called a scam known as debit skimming. This occurs when a customer uses their debit card in good faith only to have their PIN code and their card number read by a fraudster, often remotely or by video surveillance. They use this information to obtain a new card and then drain your account. In this story, we'll learn what happened to one couple and another woman whose innocent trips to the store turned into a nightmare. I just felt sick. I thought something is wrong. You know, what are you, what are you gonna do? You got no money in your account. I was shocked and I felt really violated. Debit card skimming is the process by which a fraudster will capture two pieces of debit card information. The magnetic stripe information on the back of the card and also a card holder's PIN or personal identification number. Um, what happened was on February 27th, I was out shopping for some groceries and I went to pay with my debit card. It came up that there was insufficient funds in my account um, and I knew that not to be true because I just made deposits two days before and I had my mortgage coming out two days afterwards. So I was a bit nervous about that. But after trying three times and everyone's kind of looking at me like, oh, she doesn't have any money to pay, I was embarrassed. Went home immediately and checked my bank accounts online and it showed that there was nothing left in my account. Ken and Kathy St. Thomas were in for a big surprise following Kathy's girls weekend away in Niagara Falls. My wife was going away on a girls weekend and I'm home with the dog and the cat, <laughs> the guys weekend. We had to go to the veterinarian on the, the Monday to get some medication for the dog. And when I was in there, I tried to use my bank card and uh, she said there's insufficient funds when I tried my bank card. So I tried a different account, same thing, tried this a couple of times, and I thought I didn't know what was happening. Fraudsters are 
uh, are sophisticated in their attacks, anywhere from shoulder surfing, so looking over your shoulder while you enter your pin and memorizing your pin, using a handheld skimmer, uh, or being more sophisticated and using things like pinhole cameras. The skimming does not always take place at the banks. The uh, suspects actually utilize businesses as far as to put these skimming devices in, whether they approach somebody that works in the store or whether the suspect actually works in the business for a short period of time. Uh, debit card skimming works. Uh, basically what the bad guys are doing is they're piggybacking the terminal that's used to process debit card transactions and uh, recording your debit card data when you're lawfully making a, a purchase. She came out with a stunned look on her face and she said, there's no money in the account. And I said, well, then you had a damn good weekend when you were away then, because I just put $800 in there. I said, well, I didn't use my, the bank card at all. I just paid cash for everything. And uh, there's no money in the account. I had heard it on the radio that there was some kind of a scam going on. And a, a light bulb just went off to say, go check your account, which I did. And that's when I found out there was no money in our account. So I contacted the 1-800 number for customer service. And I was not the only one to have my accounts breached um, at that location. There were, I believe there were more than 20 people that had come in the previous day. They said there's been several in the area, about five or six calls that one day, that same day. And uh, they investigated, and sure enough, we'd been hit. And someone had skimmed my account um, two times. Um, within a half an hour. So that's when we notified the police and, uh, and they would hand it on to their fraud squad and investigate what was happening. We work with uh, our partners in law enforcement, uh, merchants and card holders to, to fight off debit card fraud. And we're forcing the fraudsters to change their behavior and we're catching them uh, in the act. Through video, we're able to identify uh, two people that were involved in the theft and they are local people. Durham Regional Police Detective Jeff Kaplan takes us through some surveillance footage of a couple of fraudsters setting up their very sophisticated bank machine skimming equipment. This is now uh, a video of the uh, ATM itself. This is the young offender right there. It's a standalone machine and they're waiting for an opportunity to come in, attach their equipment without any customers being at the ATM. Because it's such a busy bank machine, they're able to get a lot of customers, debit card numbers and PIN numbers and access a lot of different accounts. The total amount they took out of my account was, I think it was $1,200. To me, that would have been chicken change to some of these other people that might have had five dollars or $10,000 in there. I was one of the lucky ones. Some of the other people actually had their Visa accounts tapped through their debit cards. The kiosk is now empty. So here comes the suspect in the red hat. He's now coming around the corner and going into the ATM area. And what he's doing now is attaching a piece of equipment to that ATM. That's the card reader. And it fits right over top of the legitimate card reader. There is a little hole in the device which allows the green flashing light to shine through from the legitimate card reader on the ATM. It's battery powered and records all the debit card numbers being used. Well, they have two pieces of equipment. One is for the card reader and one is for the pinhole camera. Here comes the second suspect. You can see he's carrying something under his shoulder. Second suspect pulls out a long light bar. The pinhole camera is concealed inside this attachment. That is the recording device. It's simply a memory card that records video. It's adapted to allow the natural light coming from there to shine through so it appears to be illuminated, which is pointing directly over top of the pin pad. It's capturing everybody's pin numbers as they're entering it. And what the suspects will do is they will marry up their debit card number and their pin number and full access to, the, to their bank accounts. Depending on the number of ATMs and the number of customers they have, they can get hundreds of uh, different people's bank information each hour. In one case uh, at a small gas station here, uh, a fellow came in using uh, fraudulent identification and advised the owner that he wished to purchase the gas station. He actually put money down that he gave the owner. So the owner was quite happy to let him work there and learn the business. I found out that where I'd bought gas and I used my, I swiped my card in the gas station, I went inside to pay for it because I didn't have any money on me, so I just used my debit card. He basically skimmed identification 
numbers from people, whether credit cards, uh, debit cards, and so on and so forth. They had a camera there watching me punch in my, my number, and I dealt with that gas station for years. A group made up of five males withdrew money from ATM machines and convenience stores, totaling thousands of dollars, and it basically affected over 100 customers. They've now left the ATM, they get back in their car, they sit in their car and they keep a close eye on their equipment. Uh, the uniform officers attended to assist and they were arrested. Both suspects have since pled guilty and received uh, their sentence. I just felt like I was robbed. There's not much else you could do. They can do whatever they want when they get that PIN number. It made me feel sick that they had got my bank account and my PIN number and withdrew the money out of my account. When I went into the local branch, the, the tellers and the bank manager were very courteous and they replaced my money right away before I left the bank. And they have an um, insurance policy in place to cover that type of incidents. Christine did have her stolen funds replaced by the bank, but she still took the time to report it to the proper agencies to help them track the crimes and hopefully to protect the next victim from this crime. The debit card network in Canada, the Interact network, uh, is among the most safe and secure networks in the world. Uh, last year we had over four billion transactions and debit card fraud affected less than a fraction of one percent of those transactions. Always protect your PIN. Hiding your PIN is your best defense against losing money to these unscrupulous criminals. Now whether you're at a lineup at a bank machine, paying for a purchase at a retailer, or buying gas at the pump, always protect your PIN. Now the debit card industry is upgrading to a more secure technology as we speak. When I started doing some research on the actual magnetic strip on the back of the card, and in Europe now they're using a chip, which is the same type of information that's encoded. The debit card industry is moving towards chip technology, which is going to take uh, computer chips and put them on the debit cards. You have uh, a computer chip on there that has encrypted information on it. That makes it much more difficult, if not impossible, for a fraudster to copy that card. We're moving towards chip technology and looking to take an already safe system and make it safer. One more time with Craig Hannaford, our fraud expert. You know, I thought I was being so clever. I never carry any cash anymore. Too big a risk. Now I feel paranoid about my PIN. How do I make sure I'm not vulnerable? Well, you know, your debit card really is a safe way to, to pay for merchandise. You just have to take a few simple steps. And the biggest one is to keep your PIN secret. No matter where you're using your PIN, just cover up your pen with your hand. <laughs> you could absolutely count on that. Is there, there, I know there's a recourse on this. I know that quite often the bank will give it back, but it's such a drag. Is there anything I can do besides just protecting my pen? If you lose money out of your account through no fault of your own, the banks are going to reimburse you, but it may take time. So the best thing is to guard your pen, guard it very, very carefully. You know, there's a lot more tips that Craig has to make sure that your pen is as safe as mine's going to be from now on. Check your monthly statements and accounts online often. If you see anything unusual, report it to your bank immediately. Don't choose a PIN that is obvious like your birth date, anniversary, address, or part of your telephone number. Only conduct transactions when and where you feel secure. If you're uncomfortable using a machine for any reason, do it later or go to another location. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Have you or anyone you've known been the victim of a fraud or a scam? Well, unfortunately, most of us have, and the statistics are growing at alarming rates. Now, the internet makes banking and shopping easy, but it also makes it easy for fraudsters to strike. It's hard to believe, but half of the people who have received suspicious emails requesting personal information don't delete the emails. In fact, Every year, millions of people respond and send their personal and financial details to all sorts of unverified sources. In this segment, Fraud Squad TV takes it to the street to hear some of your stories. Uh, like, uh, some, sometimes you just get like emails where they say, like, oh, could you confirm your personal information? Because uh, um, don't call a bank, but just confirm it and send it, right? Um, I, would, I just ignore it. I don't know, I just delete it. I, I should probably call my bank, but I don't. I was applying for a loan, and someone else's name was on in Equifax, the records of Equifax, and there was a $46,000 loan that we didn't know about, so we had to run around to lawyers and things like that. We've had to do it twice because Equifax won't remove the information. So every time we apply for a loan, we get um, uh, hassled for this uh, 
this bogus loan that is not ours. Someone sent me an email, it was a fake email, and they sent me to a link to a fake eBay page where you log in and by logging into this fake eBay page, you give them like your password and your username. And then through that, they ask, then they are able to get into your account and then they ask you to send them money. Luckily, I was able to figure it out in time, but don't uh, go, don't ever log in through like, make sure you log in through the real eBay pay page by going to ebay.ca or whatever, instead of lo like logging in through a link that you get through email. Always remember, internet fraudsters are often very good imitators of financial institutions. Don't ever give your personal or financial information on an unsecured website or email. Your bank will never request this information in this manner. I'm Naomi Joy for Fraud Squad TV. See you next week. Isn't it amazing how quickly a half hour passes on Fraud Squad TV? There's a veritable treasure trove of information on fraud at our website, fraudsquadtv.com. We'd love to have you there because remember, we're all in this fighting fraud together.